Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, we have been in a series for quite a while in the book of Psalms. Today is our ninth and final installment. Uh, and today I want to look at Psalm 88, which I'm calling, Hello, Darkness, my old friend. <laughs> it's because it's a psalm of suffering and affliction, and, it, and the psalm ends with these haunting words. Darkness is my closest friend. That's the, that's the closing line of this psalm. And in fact, Simon and Garfunkel used this psalm, this line from this psalm, in their famous uh, hit song from 1964, The Sound of Silence. Uh, so, here we go, Psalm 88, beginning in verse 1. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I'm overwhelmed with troubles, and my life draws near to death. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit, uh, like one who's without strength. Uh, I'm set apart with the dead. Uh, like the slain who lie in the grave, uh, who, whom you remember no more, who are cast off from your care. You put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Uh, your wrath lies heavily on me. You overwhelm me with all your waves. You've taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I'm confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call out to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave? Uh, your faithfulness uh, in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? Uh, or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry out to Lord, you, Lord, for help. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I've suffered. I've been close to death. I've borne your terrors, and I'm in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. You've destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They completely engulfed me. You've taken from me companion and neighbor, and now darkness is my closest friend. In Psalm 88, we see a desperate prayer from someone who's suffering and asking God for rescue, for relief. Uh, it's a psalm of petition from trouble. Uh, but unlike most of the other psalms uh, in the Psalter, uh, of other psalms even of this sort, this psalm does not end, as we've just seen, this psalm does not end on a note of hope. In almost all the other psalms that asked God for help, Either the psalmist sees God begin to move uh, in the world, or at least begin to work in his own heart. Uh, in the psalms, when the psalmist says, I'm in trouble, I'm in great need, the psalm almost always ends on a note of hope. But not this psalm. In fact, only two psalms in the entire book of psalms, uh, Psalm 39 and Psalm 88, uh, are the only ones that end without any note of hope. The word darkness, Hebrew, choshech, uh, it's used three times in this psalm, in verses 6, 12, and 18. Uh, this man is surrounded by darkness. Uh, and there's not a sliver of light uh, getting through. In fact, in the original Hebrew, uh, the word darkness is the very last word. Now, what kind of prayer ends with darkness as its last word? What is a prayer like this even doing in the Bible? And the answer is... It's doing us a lot of good if we listen to it. Because we American believers are very naive about the inevitability of suffering in this life. You know, and when, th when things go wrong, we're overthrown by it. We don't, we don't know how to process it uh, through spiritual disciplines. But this psalm is here to help us. But we've got to listen. And if we listen to it carefully, and if we read it closely, especially its tough messages uh, shouted out to us at the center, we'll also be able to discern uh, its wonderful messages that it whispers to us from the edges. Let me show you what I mean. 
uh, there are at least four messages uh, in this psalm that I'm going to talk about today that are what it teaches us. We got it on the overhead. Uh, number one, darkness, uh, both uh, spiritual uh, and personal darkness, can last a long time. However, uh, number two, times of darkness can actually be the best times to learn about God's grace. Number three, times of darkness can sometimes be the best situation for you to grow into someone of greatness. And finally, darkness can be relativized and hope can break through. So uh, darkness can last a long time. Uh, It can show you God's grace. It can turn you into someone great. Uh, Number four, it can be relativized and allow hope uh, to break through. Uh, So number one, darkness, both both spiritual and personal darkness, can last a long time. Uh, As a composition, a prayer that ends without the slightest bit of hope, without the slightest ray of light, what's that teaching us? Oh, the teaching is you can pray and pray and pray like this psalmist. Uh, You can do everything you're supposed to do, uh, calling out to God, but believing in God, living rightly. You can pray and believe and live rightly and still be absolutely plunged for a long, long, long time in both outward and inward darkness. And as I said, there's two kinds of darkness discussed here in this psalm. Uh, The outside darkness is the darkness of your your circumstances, uh, and the circumstances in this man's life. This guy's got mega problems out there in his life. We don't know exactly what they are. In fact, the Psalms seldom give us the specifics uh, of, what the, of what the problems are, the circumstances are, uh, and that's probably better that way, uh, because if you're using the Psalms to help you work through your own times of doctors, your own troubles, it's easier for you to apply them to your life uh, and make the Psalm your own and, and to relate to it if the, uh, the uh, specifics are not listed there. But here's what we do know. Uh, all of his close friends and relatives have been taken away from him. Uh, and he's facing imminent death. That's his outward darkness. But there's also an inward darkness. You know, you can almost handle the outside darkness if you don't also have an inward darkness as well. Uh, But in Psalm 88, uh, we see the psalmist battling spiritual darkness, internal darkness uh, as well. Uh, In verse 1, the psalm says he trusts in the Lord as his Savior. Look at Psalm, uh, verse 1, Psalm 88. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Uh, But in his heart, in his feelings, he's got no sense of God's presence at all. On the contrary, he says he feels like God's wrath is on him. He feels like God's anger uh, is upon him, uh, sweeping over him, destroying him. He feels abandoned by God, rejected by God, trampled on by God. There's no sense inside that he feels God's love. Uh, God's care, God's presence. You see, if you've got internal, external, external outward darkness, uh, but internally you can sense that God is with you, uh, you can sense his love for you, you can handle that then. You can handle the outward circumstances then. But when you've got both external and internal darkness, that's very hard to handle. So here's a man who prays and prays and prays, uh, lives right, does everything he possibly can, and yet when it's all said and done, He's still in darkness. And the psalm is giving us this tough message. You can be a good person. You can pray like crazy. And everything can go wrong. And you can have no sense of God's presence in your life for a long time. That's point number one. We say, what? Doesn't uh, Romans 8.28 tell us that uh, God causes everything to work together for good? For those who, who, who love him, uh, who know him and are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. Yes, the Bible says that, that God works everything to bring about his good purposes. But the Bible also says you may go all your life and never find out in this lifetime what that good purpose is. Something horrible may happen to you, and you may never in this lifetime have any idea what his ultimate purpose is in it. Remember, Romans 8.28 doesn't say that all things that happen to you are good. No, it does not say that. It says very bad things may happen, but that God will use it to ultimately work all things for good. And you might not be able to see this. 
That's to be in darkness. One commentator on Psalm 88 puts it like this. We'll put this on the overhead. He says, whoever tries to devise from the scriptures a philosophy of life in which everything always turns out right in the end will have to begin by tearing Psalm 88 out of the Bible. Because Psalm 88 ends the way it does in order to say to us, you can do everything right, and yet everything can still go wrong. Uh, it can be um, like uh, that. It can, be, it can be like that in your life for a long time, uh, and in these times, you cannot even have a sense of God being with you. Now, how does that help us? How does it help us prepare for suffering? It helps us enormously because it tells us, uh, it lets us know that this can happen, so we won't won't be taken unawares uh, by surprise. Uh, and lose heart and lose faith. And we American believers, especially you know, in upscale, suburban, even evangelical wing of the body of Messiah, we are so naive about this. Uh, and your expectations, you know, are going to have so much to do with how you process uh, what comes to you, uh, and how you can handle or not handle trials and tribulations and suffering. Uh, so for example. Let me just give you an example about how your expectations affect your whole mindset. Uh, you go into a room. Uh, before you walk into this room, you're told, this is the honeymoon suite. And you walk in, you look around, you see how really ordinary it is, and you say, what a dump. <laughs> but, but if before you went into that very same room, instead you were told, this is a prison cell. And you open the door, you say, not bad, not bad at all. <laughs> Why? Because your expectations are controlling how you experience and how you process the very same exact circumstances. So if you go out in life, uh, and as a believer, you don't think that bad things can happen to you, if you say, God would never like that, like, like let something like this happen to me, well, what are you basing that on? Certainly not the Bible. Uh, look at Job, uh, Habakkuk, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Or the New Testament, look at Paul, Peter, John, they all suffered horribly. Read Hebrews 11, the whole chapter devoted uh, to suffering saints. What about Yeshua himself? Yeshua was a good man, the very best possible person. He lived a life of pain and sorrow and suffering. The Bible says he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. His life ended in what? Uh, mocking, rejection. Uh, betrayal, abandonment, pain, suffering, excruciating torture, and death. What makes you think you are above him? Yeshua says in John 15, 20, Remember what I told you. The servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. Why do we think in America that we are exempt from suffering? The suffering that most of the, of the Old Testament and New Testament saints endured. You know, this is a dangerous escapism, entitlement mindset that we have. And we see this rampant in much of Western Christian theology, and particularly Western Christian eschatology. Uh, this, this escapism mindset. But beware. Na na naivete is as great as the danger as the trouble itself. And so when this psalm comes along, Psalm 88, and it will help us by giving us a wiser heart and preparing us for what may happen. Because darkness, both spiritual and personal, can occur and can last a long time. That's point number one. Point two, however, paradoxically, times of darkness are also some of the very best times and best places to learn about God's grace. How so? Well, look at the language of the psalm, of the psalmist. Now remember, this is a prayer. The psalms are prayers. That's why I'm, this whole series is called Yeshua's Prayer Book. Uh, the psalmist is talking to God all the way through this psalm. But, he's not, but if you look carefully, he's not controlling his temper very well, is he? <laughs> he's not controlling his tongue. Uh, he's not controlling his emotions. Uh, look at verses 10 to 12. Uh, he's praying to God, but it, instead of a prayer, it almost sounds more like a cross-examination. Uh, verse 10, he, he's, the psalmist is talking to God, and he says, Do you show your wonders to the dead, 
Uh, do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave? Your faithfulness in Abaddon, uh, destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? Or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? What's he doing? Uh, he's cross-examining God. He's putting God in the dock. Uh, he's prosecuting him. And here's what he's, and he's angry, and here's what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, I want to praise you. I want to tell of your deeds of righteousness. I want to declare your faithfulness to the world. But how can I when I've been trampled to the ground and deserted and practically killed? Don't you want me, Lord, to be able to praise you? Don't you want me to be able to tell others of your faithfulness? Isn't that the goal? Then why aren't you answering me? Why do you reject me and hide your face from me? And he cries out to God, he cries out to the Lord, and he gets no answer. And so he's mad. Uh, look at verses 15 and 16. From my youth I've suffered and been close to death. I've borne your terrors. I'm in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. From my youth, he says. What's he doing? Uh, he's taking his present difficulties and he's reading his entire life back through this lens. Uh, so in essence, he's saying to God, you've really never been there for me. Uh, Lord, you, you've never been there. The psalmist, he's not speaking deferentially to God. He's not speaking reverently to God. He's not speaking respectfully to God. In many ways, he's speaking blasphemously to God. At the very least, he's exaggerating here by accusing God of never having been there for him, saying, God, you've never done anything good for me ever. But all this only makes this psalm even greater evidence of God's grace. Uh, one of my favorite commentators, Derek Kidner, in his commentary on the book of Psalms, he says, uh, he says uh, two, the, the two psalms that end in darkness, Psalm 39 and 88, he says, he talks about them. He says, Psalm 39 ends, with, ends like this, with the sufferer saying this at the end of Psalm 39, uh, verse 13. I'll put down the overhead, please. Um, Turn your face away from me, God, so that I may have some peace before I depart and I'm no more. Basically, he's saying, God, turn away from me so that I can at least have peace before I die. <laughs> and then Psalm 88, our psalm, ends again with the psalmist saying in verse 18, darkness is my closest friend. Do you know what that means? He's saying, God, the pitch darkness of night is more comfort to me than you are. Darkness is a better friend than you. He's talking about going to bed at night and saying that in the pitch darkness and being able to go to sleep, that's my only comfort. Darkness is a better friend than you are, Lord. And so when you've got these prayers where people are speaking this, this uh, intemperately, uh, this over the top, this, this blasphemously, uh, they're screaming and they're angry and they're despondent and they're bitter. They're talking to God like this. What does it mean? Uh, and Derek Kidner says this, don't put it on the overhead. He says, the very presence of these prayers in the scriptures are a witness to God's understanding. He knows how men speak when they're desperate. Think about how these prayers got into the Bible. God didn't censor them. God didn't take them out. God didn't say, I don't want these prayers in my Bible. I don't want to be identified with people who think like that, talk like that, pray like that. Rather, by keeping these prayers in the scriptures, God does identify with them. The Lord's saying, I am still the God of this man, in spite of the way he talks. And that's why Derek Kidner can say, the very presence of these prayers, the fact that God keeps them in there, is a testimony that he understands and he knows how we talk when we get like this. It doesn't matter. He says, I I'm still your God. That's what he's saying. Uh, indeed, uh, look at verse 1 again. The psalmist says in Psalm 88, verse 1, Lord, you are the God who saves me. He acknowledges, despite all of his troubles, he acknowledges that God is his Savior. The Lord's saying, I'm your God. 
Not because you put a happy face on all the time uh, for me. Not because you say everything is right. Not because you do everything just right. Not because you always speak reverently to me and deferentially to me. I'm your God because I'm a God of grace. I'm a God of grace in spite of what you're doing. In spite of everything you do wrong. I'm still your God. We need that. We need that so much. And in my weakness and my failure, that's when I most see God's patience and his grace. Not in my times of prosperity and happiness. So let's put this on the overhead. Number one, uh, doctors can last a long time. Number two, these can be the best times to learn about God's grace. Number three, it's especially in these times of absolute darkness, when not only do you not see God working in your life, but you don't even see him working in your heart either, these times are perhaps the supreme opportunities for you to become someone great. When you're experiencing darkness, both, both outside and inside, uh, you're getting absolutely nothing out of prayer, are you? Nothing. And you're getting nothing out of serving God, nothing. He doesn't, he, he doesn't, have, he doesn't pay a bit for you. Uh, there's no benefit at all. Uh, and paradoxically, these are the very times when you can grow the most. And by the way, we saw this, didn't we, in our series on the book of Job uh, uh, last year. If you recall, the book of Job starts out with this, this scene in heaven, right? Uh, with Satan taunting God. And Satan points down at Job, and he mockingly says to God, look at Job, verse one, verse, Job 1, verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? And what Satan's doing here, he's not just pointing at Job, is he? He's pointing at you and at me. He's pointing to devoted Yeshua followers. And he's saying to the Lord, look at your so-called devoted followers. Oh, they're not really serving you. They're only serving because it pays. Uh, they say, oh, I'm serving God. Uh, I'm serving my neighbor. I'm serving the poor. But they're really only doing it because it's a way of really serving themselves. Because they know that if they do these things uh, for, for you like this, that then you'll answer their prayers. And you'll take them to heaven. Uh, and you'll bless them. So they're not really loving you, God. Uh, they're loving themselves. They're not really serving their neighbor. They're serv serving themselves. Uh, yeah, they help the poor, but they do it in order to feel good about themselves. And to feel superior to those who, other people who don't help the poor. And that's Satan's accusation against Job. Uh, and against all humanity, all of us. Satan says, at bottom, all humans are absolutely self-centered. Even when they look like they're serving God uh, or serving other people, they're really doing it for themselves. They're serving themselves. Uh, they're not loving you, God. Uh, they're not loving their neighbor. Uh, they're loving themselves. That's why this world is such a mess. Uh, and Satan says, I can prove it to you. Uh, plunge some of them into darkness. Plunge them into darkness. Don't answer any of their prayers. Uh, don't give them any sense of your presence in their heart. Take away all their earthly comforts. Set things up such, 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 in such a way that serving you pays nothing. No earthly benefits. And you'll see they will curse you. They will curse you to your face. Because they're not servants. They're really just mercenaries. Wow. What an accusation. What do you think? Is Satan right? You know, in many ways, sadly, yes, he is. Because that's how we typically deal with God, if we're honest, isn't it? Or at least that's the way we start out with God. Uh, the average believer often, you know, prays, uh, reads his Bible, uh, goes to synagogue or, or church because he or she has needs that they want met. Because you've got a problem you want God to solve. And you want something from him. But as soon as things get hard and your prayers aren't being answered, uh, our typical response is, hey, I'm doing everything right. I'm, I'm living a good life. Uh, I'm praying. I'm reading my Bible. I'm tithing. Why, God, aren't you coming through for me? And by this response, we begin to show that Satan is right about us. We're only serving God for the blessings. 
We often start out with this kind of uh, shallowness of character. Uh, Satan is right about the self-centeredness of the human heart. But something else begins to happen to this guy in Psalm 88. Because as bad as this psalm looks, uh, as much as he complains and exaggerates and accuses God and yells and screams at God and complains and is bitter and despondent, and yet notice this, all through it all, he's screaming and is bitter and is despondent before God. Every single thing he does in this psalm is a prayer to God. Even at the very end, when he says, darkness is my closest friend, he's saying it to God. He's still with God. He's staying with God, even though he's getting nothing out of it. What does that mean? It means Satan has been defeated. Something has happened in this man's life, even in the midst of the darkness, even though he's getting nothing out of it, he's staying with God. Staying with God for nothing. And I want us to note that it's only when we find ourselves in this kind of dual darkness, both external you know, bad circumstances, uh, internal lack of sense in God's presence, uh, when we're serving and praying to God, when it, when it seems to give you nothing, it's in these times when the greatest choice comes to you. A choice. Because it's precisely in these times uh, when God says to you, now we'll see if you got into this relationship with me to serve me or just to get me to serve you. Now we'll find out. At this time when nothing seems to be going right for you, now we'll see. Will you serve me for nothing? The Lord says. And to these times in darkness that you've got to hold on. Uh, maybe you scream at God. Maybe you complain bitterly to him. Tell him you're mad at him. Uh, but you also say, despite it all, I'm not going anywhere. I will not abandon my trust in you. As Job said, look at Job 13, 15. Though you slay me, yet I will hope in you. Where Shimon, Cephas, Simon Peter said to Yeshua, John, 8, uh, John 6, 68, Lord, where else shall we, go? shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I'm going to stay and pray and serve you no matter what, because you, Yeshua, are my Lord, because you're God and I'm not. And if you do that, like this psalmist, you will have defeated Satan. You'll defeat Satan. And you'll be growing more and more into Messiah's likeness. Because when the darkness lifts or lessens, and it eventually will, you'll find that the presence, that, that, that you'll find that the pressure you, uh, that you were under, and your choice in the midst of this pressure to, to press into Yeshua in the face of your suffering, uh, you'll find it would have turned your heart into something wonderful and glorious. Just like the pressure is what turns a lump of coal into a diamond. You have a fortitude, an, un 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 unflappability, uh, a poise you never otherwise would have had. Because it's only in your, in your times of darkness that you can prove to yourself that you truly serve God for nothing. And therefore, it's only in times of darkness you can forge this indomitable spirit, uh, a spirit that cannot be, be uh, dominated or, 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 or daunted or defeated by the devil. And here's a, here's a quick illustration. Uh, uh, the strength of spirit, I, I think, it's described so beautifully uh, near the end of my all-time favorite book, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, we've got uh, Sam Ganji and Frodo are trekking to Mount Doom uh, to destroy the evil ring of power. And suddenly Sam realizes, we're going to die. Uh, no matter what happens, we're going to die. And so he's about to give up. Uh, but then the text says this. We'll put it on the overhead. It says, but even as hope died in Sam, or, or seemed to die, it was turned into a new strength. Sam's plain hobbit face grew stern, almost grim, uh, as the will hardened in him. And he suddenly felt through all his limbs a thrill. Uh, as if he were turning into some creature of stone and steel uh, that neither uh, despair nor weariness nor endless barren miles could ever subdue. He suddenly realizes in the face of death, 
I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, regardless of the consequences. I don't care if this quest seems hopeless. I'm going to pursue my destiny and my calling. And when he made that determination, he felt through his limbs, it says, a thrill. Uh, he was given a resolve that neither despair nor weariness nor endless barren miles could subdue. Paradoxically, it's in the darkness when you're most able to grow uh, and to become a great heart, uh, a brave heart, a glorious heart. So, um, the overhead, please. Number one, darkness can last a long time. Number two, we can show you God's grace. Number three, it can turn you into something great. And then finally, number four, darkness can be what I'm going to call relativized and give way to hope. What do I mean by that? Uh, when you're in the midst of darkness, you tend to feel like, like it's absolute. Uh, the psalmist here feels that God's rejection of him is complete. Uh, that God's wrath is on him, uh, that God had abandoned him, that, that this darkness was absolute, it was, it was permanent, uh, but he was wrong. How do we know the psalmist was wrong? Well, if you look at the actual Hebrew, the title to this psalm, we're told it's written by a man called Heman, H-E-M-A-N. Uh, and if you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 6, it's, you find out that Heman was the head of the Korachite guild of musicians and singers uh, and poets uh, who wrote the, many of the, of the various psalms. Most of the psalms that were not written by David were written by them. Uh, in fact, they wrote Psalms 42 to 49 and Psalms 84 to 89. And if you read these psalms, you're going to see these are some of the greatest psalms ever written. Uh, but if Haman helped write some of the, the greatest psalms in the Psalter, uh, that means He's produced some of the greatest artistry in the history of the world. And you know what that means? His darkness turned him into a world-class artist whose sobs have helped millions of people for millennia. You know, from his immediate point of view, he thought God had abandoned him. But in reality, uh, the darkness he suffered, God used it to turn him into this amazing artist whose writings have helped untold millions of people. You know, I thought he knew that, you know, some 2,500 years later, people in a messianic shul in Dallas, Texas, would be gathering together to talk about his art. <laughs> he may have felt like a lump of coal, but God turned him into a diamond. And so Haman was wrong. God had not abandoned him. The darkness he felt was not absolute and total and permanent. And you can know that too. You may ask me, when I feel alone, when I feel abandoned by God in my darkness, how can I know His love is real and abiding and faithful to me? Here's how. At the end of Psalm 39, the psalmist says, Turn your face away from me, God. At the end of Psalm 88, he says, darkness is my closest friend. Does this remind you of anyone? Turn your face from me. I'm in darkness. Look at Matthew 27, 45. From noon to 3 p.m., darkness descended over the face of the land. About 3 p.m., Yeshua cries out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you turned your face from me? Why have you forsaken me? And then in verse 51, Matthew 27 51, at that moment, uh, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks split, and the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Yeshua got the ultimate darkness uh, that Himon thought he had gotten, uh, but hadn't. Yeshua got total darkness. He got the real wrath. He was truly abandoned by God. Why? Why? Why was darkness his only friend? Uh, because everything Satan accused us of was true. We are self-centered. We do exploit one another. Uh, we do serve God for our own mercenary ends. So we deserve God to turn his face from us but he wants to forgive us. 
But forgiveness has a cost, my friends. When you forgive someone who's wronged you, that means that you absorb the debt. You don't make them pay, you pay. That's really what forgiveness is. And so for God to forgive us all of our tremendous sins, he had to absorb the cost and pay the debt himself. How? Well, he did this all by, by coming to earth in the form of Yeshua, the Messiah, and dying on the cross and paying the debt himself for your sins and mine. He took the darkness, the ultimate darkness, uh, the ultimate wrath, so that now our darkness uh, is only apparent uh, and temporary and, and relative. Yeshua was truly abandoned so that you won't be. Because on the cross, darkness was Yeshua's only friend. And therefore, when you trust in him, God can now be your friend. When the psalmist sarcastically asks, look at Psalm 88, verse 10, sarcastically asks God, do you show your wonders to the dead? Do they rise up and praise you? Well, the answer now in Yeshua is yes. He does raise us from the dead to new newness of life in order to praise him. The promise of the resurrection, amazing promise, ultimately defeats darkness and all the forces of darkness. Yeshua took the darkness on our behalf, so that in him we now have hope. Look at Revelation 21, verse 4, the ultimate hope. He says, God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. There is nothing more practical for sufferers than to have hope. The erosion or the loss of hope is what makes suffering unbearable. And here at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, is the ultimate hope. A new world. And with all darkness and suffering is gone, every tear wiped from your eyes, this is a life-transforming, living hope. You know, when John, he wrote this book of Revelation, he wrote it to people who were suffering terrible trials and tribulations. He wrote it to the early Messianic Jews who were experiencing death and mourning and crying and pain. Uh, their homes were being confiscated. Believers were thrown into the Roman arena to be torn to pieces by wild beasts as the crowds cheered on. Others were impaled on stakes and covered in pitch and set aflame. And what did John give them? What does John give them here to face this? In the book of Revelation, he gives them the ultimate hope, a new heavens and a new earth. And with this hope, these early Yeshua followers, they endured they endured their suffering with the greatest poise and peace unimaginable. Uh, and they sang hymns as these wild beasts were tearing them apart limb from limb. And they forgave the people who were killing them. And so the more they were killed, the more the Yeshua movement grew. Why? Because when people watched these believers dying like that, they said, these people have something I don't have. What is it that they had? A living hope. We are hope-shaped creatures. The way you live right now is controlled by what you believe your future is going to be. You know, I read an account recently of two men who were captured, a true story, captured, thrown into a dungeon. One man was told his wife and children uh, were dead. The other learned that his family was still alive and, and waiting for him. Notice these two men experienced the exact same outward circumstances in the dungeon but they responded very differently because while they experienced the same present, their minds were set on very different futures. Uh, and it was this hope for the future that determined how they handled their present. Uh, and, and so within a few years of imprisonment, the first man wasted away. Uh, he curled up and died. The second man endured and stayed strong and walked out a free man 10 years later. Again, they experienced the same outward circumstances, but handled it so differently because how they live their present is determined by how they envision their future. John was able to help these early believers by giving them hope for the future. Do you believe when you die, you just rot? Uh, that the life in this world is all the happiness you're ever going to have. 
That's one way to imagine your future. Here's another. Do you believe in Yeshua's promise of a new heavens and a new earth? Do you believe in the, in the future judgment day when every evil deed and every injustice will be judged and redressed? Do you believe that in Yeshua, you're headed for a future of endless joy? These are two very different futures. And depending on which one you believe, you can handle your suffering and your times of darkness in two very different ways. Let me close with another great example of this I recently read uh, about the origin of the Negro spirituals, the songs that the slaves composed and sung in, in, in the South before the Civil War. Uh, you know, the African American slaves composed these amazing so spiritual songs, uh, these deeply moving hymns. Uh, they were filled with references to heaven uh, and judgment day and crowns and thrones and, and robes they'll someday wear. And here's how this African-American uh, Harvard scholar named uh, Howard Thurman, how he described this, this. We'll put this in the overhead. He said, the black slaves sung their faith. This served to deepen their capacity to endure and to absorb suffering. It taught them how to ride high in life and to look squarely in the face of suffering uh, and to use it as the raw material out of which they fashioned a hope that even their bondage with all its cruelty, could not crush. Their faith enabled them to reject annihilation and to affirm their indomitable, never-say-die spirit. The American slaves had a strong faith in Yeshua. They knew that one day all their hopes would be fulfilled. They knew that one day all the perpetrators of injustice one day would face the ultimate judge. And all the wrongs would be, would be put right. And there was a, 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 uh, there was a hope that they had that even the slave master's whip could not extinguish. Why? Because it was a hope not only set in the present, but set in the future. A hope in the new Jerusalem uh, uh, that can never be snuffed out because it's a certainty, because it's based on God's word. You know, we today, we aren't likely to be thrown to lions. Uh, and torn limb from limb, uh, as other people cheer, cheer on. Uh, we aren't likely to, to be slaves forced to pick cotton under the brutal sun. We may have things we suffer, but nothing like, like wild beasts and whips. So if this great hope of the new heavens and the new earth uh, help the early believers and help the southern slaves to face their problems, uh, then, then how much more should it help us face our much less serious problems today. And if you can be sure of this future, you can be sure of this now. If you turn from your sin, if you turn from yourself, and you turn to Yeshua, and you commit your life to Him, He took the darkness that you deserve so that you may have His light. If you are in Yeshua, you are made like him, you will rise, yours the cry, and as the song says, ours the cross, ours the grave, ours the skies. Yeshua bore our hopelessness so that we now have hope. He bore our darkness so that we now have light. He bore our abandonment by God so that we can now have fellowship with him. So now even the worst things will one day become the best things, and the greatest things are yet to come. And therefore, all true prayer, even dark prayers like the Psalm 88, eventually end in praise. All true prayer eventually ends in praise. And we see this in the very last Psalm in the Psalter, of Psalm 150. We're going to end like this as we close out this series on the book of Psalms. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah in the Hebrew. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. So that's verse 1. Verse 1 is asking, where should we praise God? And the answer, everywhere. In His sanctuary, in the universe, everywhere. Uh, okay, verse 2, why should we praise Him? Verse 2, praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. In other words, why should we praise Him? For everything. Where should we praise Him? Everywhere. Okay, number 3. How should we praise Him? Look at verses 3 to 5. In every way, with everything. Praise Him with the blast of the shofar. 
Praise him with a harp and lyre. Praise him with a drum and dance. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Praise him with resounding trumpets. And then finally, who should praise him? That's verse 6. Everyone, that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we end this series today in this book of Psalms, Yeshua's prayer book, let's ask, why does it end in praise? Why does the book of Psalms end in praise? Because all true prayer, if pursued long enough, becomes praise. Any prayer, no matter how desperate its origin, no matter how painful and fearful its circumstances and its subject matter, if grounded in the Lord ends, it will end in praise. And as we've seen here in Psalm 88, it doesn't always come easily or quickly. The trip can last a lifetime. But in the end, it's always the same. It always ends in praise. It may take years uh, or decades, uh, uh, but, 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 but decades before certain prayers can end in the hallelujahs of Psalm 150. Not every prayer is capped off with praise. Many in the book of Psalms do not. But true prayer is always reaching towards praise and will eventually arrive there when one day heaven and earth meet and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Hallelujah. Yeah, I want the music team to come on up, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you for your prayer book, the book of Psalms. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Even in our darkest times, you are there. Whether we sent you or not, you're there. You're, in, you're with us in the pit. You're with us in suffering. You're with us in trials and tribulations, in loss of loved ones, in breakups of relationships, in sorrow and in grief. You are there. And we know that you are with us, uh, and that you care. Why do we know this, Lord? Because you left heaven, Yeshua, and you came to earth, and you became one of us. And you experienced everything we experience. And you experienced suffering and pain and disappointment and betrayal. You, Lord, were a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So you now have become our great high priest who can identify with us and empathize with us and represent us and restore us to fellowship with you, Lord. You are the only God with wounds. You are the only God with scars. You're not aloof from our suffering, uh, but you've humbled yourself. You've entered into our suffering, Lord. You've experienced it, and you've become obedient, even to death, even death on the cross. And therefore, you are now our great high priest who saves completely. Uh, those who come to the Father through you, Lord, are, uh, can, can have confidence because you always live to make intercession for us. So, Lord Yeshua, we come before you today in praise and in prayer, in prayer that ends in praise. We come before you with shouts of joy and, and, and praise among the festive throng. And we ascend to your altar, Lord. Uh, Lord, you are my God, my joy, my delight. We praise you with harp and lyre, with drum and dance and joyful song. For you are my Savior and my God, my King and my husband. Yeshua, ride forth victoriously with victory and splendor and might, that all the nations fall at your feet, that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. B'Shem Yeshua. Omei. Shabbat Shalom. For more information, visit us at www.etzheim.org. That's spelled E-I-T-Z dash C-H-A-I-M dot org. Or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services.